Hello, true face crimeers. This is the case of Charles Lee Duffy. Viewer discretion is advised. This is unfortunately another case where there really just isn't much information and there is not much background information on either the perpetrator or the victims. And sadly, I don't have any photos of the victims. Charles Lee Duffy was born on May 10th, 1976. And he was born in Norcross, Georgia, and that's essentially where he would live the majority of his life, as far as I can tell. I do know that Charles had a history with the law, typically with things like break-ins, uh, just theft, and nothing too extreme, but that would seem to change for him in 1997. It was June 24th, 1997. Priscilla Culberson was a 40-year-old resident uh, in the DeKalb County, Georgia area. She was expected at her job, but she didn't show up. This was very unusual for her because she was never late for work and she never called out. So her co-workers were immediately concerned. They tried calling her. They couldn't reach her. She wasn't answering. So when her family found out, she was reported missing. Within a couple of days of her being reported missing, some of her belongings were found scattered along a road near Atlanta. This included her purse with her ID in it and everything like that. Her purse and the other belongings they found had blood on them, blood that would later be attributed to Priscilla. Priscilla was a mother. Uh, she had a 20-year-old daughter uh, at the time of this case. And it would be about a day or so after her belongings were found when her 20-year-old daughter found her mother's body near, uh, I guess, a bus stop. She was completely nude. There were clothing items that belonged to her that were found that also had blood on them, but that blood was not attributed to Priscilla. They would later find out that that blood belonged to an unknown male. Priscilla was described as a very feisty woman, very... She didn't really put up with much stuff. So they believe what happened was that when she was attacked, she fought like hell. And she likely either punched or scratched this individual badly enough that he actually would, like, spray blood out of his body onto her clothing. Because it wasn't just, like, a drop or two of blood. It was a lot. So she got him good. They did also find male bodily fluids uh, on her body. And at the time when they tried to link it to anyone, the DNA, it came up with no one. And her case would actually go cold. On July 30th, 1997, at approximately 5 p.m., 42-year-old Gwendolyn Weish, who was actually the daughter of a local minister in the DeKalb County, Georgia area, she was just outside of her home when neighbors reported to hear several gunshots. Neighbors immediately called police once they heard the shots, and when an ambulance arrived, Gwendolyn was still alive. The perpetrator was not there, and no witnesses claimed to see who the perpetrator was. She was rushed to the nearby hospital, but unfortunately she would succumb to her wounds and she was pronounced dead later that evening. They were able to determine that the type of gun that was used was a revolver. And by the way, I forgot to mention in the first case, the victim, Priscilla, was also shot with what they believed was a revolver. What was the motive for this particular case? Kind of like the first one, they weren't sure. Possibly robbery, but they also couldn't confirm if anything was stolen from her. In this second murder, there were witnesses who, again, didn't see the man, but did see someone driving away or speeding away from the crime scene in a hurry. But all witnesses could say was that it was like a blue kind of compact car. Just a normal looking blue car. It would be just a couple of days later after this one when another murder took place. August 1st, 1997, a 52-year-old woman named Polk Yao Kim was working at a Buddy's convenience store there in DeKalb County, Georgia. The store was located on Columbia Drive. 
Police were later able to confirm kind of what happened because this store had surveillance in it. So essentially what happened was a man described as a black male, approximately 23 to 25 years old, about 5 foot 11, 160 pounds, had a medium build and a, a slight mustache and like a short afro style haircut is what they described it as. He came in, pointed a gun at uh, Miss Kim and they could see him essentially robbing her. He reached over and grabbed money out of the till that she opened. And then she turned around and he shot her uh, numerous times in the back. And then the camera picked up the man fleeing. The ammunition that was used in this case was the same ammunition that was used in the case prior to this. I don't know if they ever matched that ammunition to the very first murder I talked about, but these, these last two were connected. So police, who could not identify the man in the video footage, decided to release the image to the media. So the man's face was put all over the news, and eventually a woman called and said, I think that man is my son. She told police, yeah, the man in that footage that you showed, I'm convinced, I, I know, is my 21-year-old son, Charles Duffy. They looked into Charles Duffy's uh, records, and he was, during the time of these murders, he was out on parole because he had been in prison and was released in January of 1997 uh, on parole from uh, crimes like robbery and grand theft. So he was out and about during the time of these murders. So they had his fingerprints on file and they were able to confirm because at the murder of Miss Kim at the convenience store, there was a partial fingerprint there. And that partial fingerprint, once they had Charles Duffy's name, they were able to quickly match that it was the same print. Charles Duffy, however, refused to turn himself in. Uh, and so he basically, even though his mom ratted him out, uh, which is pretty awesome, actually. Good for mom. His mom was telling him, you need to go to the police now. You need to turn yourself in. I know that's you, and I know you did this. Turn yourself in. But he's like, no. And eventually, he kind of ran, sort of, but not really. He was still in the area. Police just couldn't track him down. A couple of days after they got this call from the mom, and after they confirmed the fingerprint, a man was arrested because he was walking down the street, uh, being belligerent, being very loud, disturbing the peace. He was clearly very, very high on some kind of drug. The man identified himself as Tara Smith, and when they searched him, he had a screwdriver on him, which they considered a deadly weapon, I guess. So, he was then sent to the jail. But then they found out uh, fairly quickly that this man was not actually a man named Taurus Smith. This was Charles Lee Duffy. He gave them a fake name because he didn't want them to know who he was. They sat him down and they said, listen, we, we heard from your mom. She said the man in the, in the video was you and they confirmed, you know what? We can see that that man is you. We've got your fingerprints uh, at the crime scene that was directly involved with the murder. We also have, you know, the ammunition that was used in, in Miss Kim's murder and then also the ammunition used in Mrs. Uh, Weish's murder. And so we, we have a pretty good feeling that it's you. And so Charles Duffy just said, yeah, yeah, that was me. And he gave them a full confession. He was not coerced in any way. Uh, he was not, uh, he didn't, they didn't sit him down for 30, 40, 50 hours without sleep or anything. He eventually became very open, very forthcoming about what he did. He would plead guilty to the murders of Miss Kim and Miss Weish, and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. But we did have that first murder I talked about, the murder of Miss Culberson. When Charles Duffy was arrested and eventually confessed to the murders, he only ever confessed to those two murders, and they never, I guess, connected him to those murders at the time. DNA in 1997 was more advanced, obviously, than it was in, like, say, the 80s or the 70s or something like that, but it still wasn't advanced enough. But in 2003, they opened the cold case of Priscilla Culberson, and... They took the male bodily fluid that was found with her body 
and they put it into the system. And then at this point, Charles Duffy, his DNA is now in the system. And so in 2003, when they plug in the DNA from the, the murder, it gets a match to Charles Lee Duffy. So they go and speak to Mr. Duffy and they present him with the evidence. We got your DNA there. We do also know that the ammunition is the same type of ammunition that you used in the other two murders. He confessed. He said, yep, that was also me. I guess he didn't want to confess initially, even though he was getting a life in prison without parole. I'm not sure why he didn't mention it. Maybe he wanted to limit his involvement, I guess. He confessed and he would plead guilty to the third murder and he was tacked on with another life sentence. So he got a total of three life sentences without the possibility of parole. So he will be spending the rest of his life in prison. Why did he do it? It's not really truly known. It was probably robbery was the ultimate motive just because he was, it was proven that he did rob one of the victims, but they just couldn't determine if the other two victims were truly robbed or not, but they could have very well been. He could have just been because he was a known drug user, he could have just been high out of his mind and also wanted money. And so he just killed these women for that reason. Could have been sexual assault because he did sexually assault the first victim. So maybe sex was the motive for one of them, the first one, but not the other two. So seems like a very mixed kind of motive type deal, but it doesn't necessarily matter because he confessed uh, wholeheartedly and all the evidence links directly to him. So. Why he did it, I guess, are his own reasons, but he did it. And now he's spending the rest of his life in prison. I really wish I had some photos of the victims. I tried looking on the find the graves and for obituaries, but there's nothing, which is kind of sad, but unfortunately it, it happens. Six people attend a party in Texas. Only one survives. Hello, true face crimerers. This is the case of Coy Wayne Westbrook. Viewer discretion is advised. Coy Wayne Westbrook, whose nickname for some reason was Elvis, he was born on February 1st, 1958 in Houston, Texas, and he basically lived in that general area for all of his life. Really not much is known about him or his eventual victims, but in July of 1995, Coy would marry uh, his fiance. Her name was Gloria Jean Coons. The marriage didn't last that long, roughly two years or so, because they got divorced in 1997. Coy really wanted to reconcile, and he wanted to, you know, work on the marriage and get it back together. But it didn't really appear that Gloria had any interest in that. On November 13th, 1997, in the city of Channel View, Texas, Gloria, uh, who is now living uh, in her own apartment with uh, a roommate, and the roommate is 43-year-old Diana Money. Gloria, at this point, is 32. So, on that particular evening, November 13th, 1997, Gloria was having just a little party with a few of her friends. And she invited Koi to come to the party. Koi said that he was under the impression that there was going to be the possibility of reconciling their relationship at this party. And that's why he would end up attending it. At approximately 2 o'clock in the morning, several people would call 911. They reported that there were gunshots, at least four or five gunshots, coming from an apartment somewhere in, this, in the vicinity. The upstairs neighbor said they heard shouting followed by the gunshots. Some of the neighbors were awoken by the shots. One neighbor called 911 after he had gone outside to see a man lying face down on the concrete just outside uh, the apartment that was below him. And then there was a man who appeared to be putting a rifle away in his car and just sort of leaning next to his truck. When police arrived, the man leaning against the truck who had just put the rifle away was Coy Wayne Westbrook. The man lying on the ground outside was deceased. When police enter the apartment, they do so cautiously. They've already cuffed Coy and they would find four more people. 
two other people were already pronounced dead at the scene. There were two others who had still been alive. And so when the ambulance arrived, one of the survivors was lying on the bed in the bedroom. This would turn out to be Gloria Coons. She, however, would be pronounced dead uh, after several minutes of the ambulance crew working on her. The other victim was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, five days later, that person would pass away as well. So at this apartment, there were five ultimately dead bodies and one guy who survived. The guy who put a rifle back in his truck and just calmly waited to be arrested. Why would Coy do this? Well, they only ever have his version of events because he left no survivors, ultimately, and no witnesses. The person who survived for several days uh, never regained consciousness, so they were never able to actually tell their version of what happened. Coy says he was there under the impression that he and Gloria were going to be reconciling this relationship. But sometime shortly after he arrived, Gloria, according to him, sort of initiated the conversation of like sex, you know, at the party. And this would lead to Gloria taking uh, two men who were there at the party to her bedroom. One of the men was Kelly Haslip, and then the other man was Anthony Rogers. I only have a photo of Anthony Rogers and Gloria. I cannot find photos of any other person alongside, you know, Coy. But again, according to Coy, uh, several, he doesn't really specify how much long later, but Gloria walks out of the room and next to her is Anthony Rogers. His pants are unzipped and she says out loud to the group, I just performed, you know, orally on, on him and that she said she was planning on going back in and having sex with Kelly Paslip. And so she goes back in the room. Coy says this completely humiliated him. He was uh, basically feels like he was tricked into going to this party just so he could be humiliated by Gloria. Again, this is his account. We don't know what truly happened. We only know what he said. So I guess at one point, Coy just sort of t picks up his keys, uh, even though he's had a few beers at this point, and he begins to go to his uh, truck. And then one of the other men at the party, Antonio Cruz, according to Coy, follows him out of the apartment, manages to take the keys away from Coy, and basically go back into the apartment, where I guess he, uh, Coy, is being mocked by everyone. And they're basically playing keep away with the keys, and this is really pissing Coy off. And then at one point, the Gloria's roommate, Ruth Money, took a full beer can and chucked it at, at Coy. However, when Coy had come back into the apartment to try to get his keys, he had something with him, a rifle. It was a 30 6 hunting rifle. When the beer can hit him, he says that he instinctively like pulled the trigger and it and sent a bullet through Ruth and she fell to the ground. And then at this point, Antonio and Anthony begin to charge towards him when he then fires two more rounds and hitting both men. And then he goes into the bedroom where Gloria is still with uh, Kelly. And he says they were engaging in sexual intercourse when he then goes within like a foot or two of each of them and fires uh, a round into each one of them as well. So now he has shot five people who would all end up dying. And he, when he was arrested, he didn't deny that he shot people, but he said, he didn't murder anyone. He said what he did was kind of half self-defense, you know, because some of the men had charged him. He had a beer can thrown at him. Okay. And also part, they had basically mocked him to the point of, of putting him into a rage where he was able to just go grab his gun and shoot people. But you, you have to also understand he made the conscious decision to grab his gun and then he made the decision to pull the trigger and shoot five people. 
He could have stopped at any point. I understand he felt humiliated, if his story is even true. Uh, I understand he felt that that scent made his blood boil. If his story is true, I don't blame him for feeling pissed. But a lot of people have been embarrassed, and a lot of people have been, have been in a rage, and a lot of people have been in a lot of situations where they don't go grab a gun and shoot people. He made that decision. He chose to shoot and kill people. But for what it's worth, you know, he was calmly arrested. He, he gave no, he didn't fight the cops. You know, he told them where the gun was. He cooperated fully. And, but that was it. He just murdered five people and remained relatively calm afterwards. So within a year, he goes on trial and he is found guilty of all five counts of uh, murder. His defense tried to play the card of, well, he has a low IQ and he mentally unsound. So, you know, you shouldn't, you should not sentence him to death. But this is Texas. <laughs> so despite he did, they did confirm that he did have a low IQ but it was not within the the realm of legally speaking where they wouldn't be able to sentence him sentence him to death and that's what he got he was sentenced to death he managed to get his case presented i think in 2006 or 7 presented in like an appeals court stating that because of his low IQ because of psychiatrist testimony that he should be have a reduced sentence at least if not get a new trial but his appeal was denied all of his appeals would eventually be denied and on march 9th 2016 in the huntsville unit at the texas state penitentiary at 804 p.m coy wayne westbrook was executed by lethal injection part of his final words were i'm sorry i can't bring everybody back I wish things could have been a lot different. I am very sorry. Which is actually kind of rare. You don't see a lot of, uh, you know, sincere, sincere apologies for someone's final words. So take it for what you will. But that's the end of his story. A young woman runs out of gas on the highway. And then she has never been seen since. Hello, true face crimers. This is the disappearance of Crystal Kipper. Viewer discretion is advised. Crystal Kipper was born on April 17th, 1978. She lived uh, most of her life in Kansas City, Missouri. It was February 24th, 1997. Crystal at this point is 18 years old. She had driven from Kansas City to St. Joseph's, uh, Missouri. She picked up a friend and the two of them went ice skating. Crystal drove a 1989 Ford Probe LX. Apparently, the ice skating uh, adventure went great. They had a good time. Crystal was in good spirits. And so then afterwards, uh, she dropped her friend off at home. On the way back to the friend's house, the friend noticed that the low fuel light came on in Crystal's car. And so the, the friend was like, well, we can go stopping, you know, so you can get gas. Crystal said, no, don't worry about it. I know my car, um, even though with the light on, I can get back to Kansas City without any issues, so no need to do that. So she dropped the friend off, and then she left, and then that would be the last time anyone had any contact with Crystal Kipper again. Now, this was at approximately 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the friend told Crystal, when you get home, please call me. Crystal said, absolutely. Crystal never called. It is believed at this point that sometime around 2.30 in the morning, Crystal's car did run out of gas. And this was on the Interstate 29, just north of the Kansas City International Airport. They would find out later. So a truck driver had been driving on the same road and he looked at his uh, clock and it was about 2.34 a.m. when he saw a young woman uh, who was outside of her car, a car that looked just like Crystal's. And a description of the young woman, he said, looked like Crystal. Uh, and that she appeared to be distraught. But the truck driver also noticed a, a vehicle 
kind of parked a little bit a ways ahead of ways of Crystal and then backing up towards her car. So the truck driver assumed this person stopped to help her, whatever her issue is. And so he just kept going. Except Crystal wasn't getting help as far as people know or speculate. When Crystal didn't arrive home, the family noticed pretty quickly, and so they reported her missing. Her mom and uh, drove, I guess, the, the similar routes that Crystal would have been on, and she, lo and behold, found Crystal's vehicle parked on the side of the road on Interstate 29, and they would later find out it was parked in the same exact spot where the truck driver saw this, you know, uh, situation. The battery of her car was dead. The gas was completely gone, uh, but the hazard lights were on and they were flashing. But there was absolutely no trace of Crystal Kipper. I don't know exactly how the connection was made, but police would interview a man named John E. Williams. A picture of him I cannot find. I have been looking. Sometimes you look through, like, you try to find, like, yearbook photos or anything, and it's uh, unbelievable how hard it is to find some of these pictures. So, like I said, I don't know how they specifically connected him to Crystal, but uh, they had a general knowledge of John Williams uh, prior because he had been accused of abducting another young woman in the past. He had an issue with the law in the past. So this could somewhat fit his MO. And they interviewed him and something just seemed off with this guy. And so they were actually able to obtain a warrant to search his home in connection to Crystal's disappearance. And they found some stuff. They found Crystal's ID. They found her pay stubs, her car keys, because they were missing from the car. They found a turtleneck sweater that belonged to her and a pair of her jeans, all inside John Williams' home. Police would, down the road, test the clothing for DNA, and it came back to belonging to Crystal. So they confirmed through science that those clothing items were crystals. It was not just a visual, like, yeah, she owned a pair similar. But you also can't refute the guy had her ID and her pay stubs. The clothing was uh, ripped. It appeared to have been involved in some kind of altercation. And then police would find out uh, that John Williams, the day after Crystal disappeared, he had gotten his windshield replaced because it had some serious damage to it. So he was, of course, arrested under suspicion of some involvement. And as he was arrested, they brought him back in for more extensive questioning. And it was at this point where he said, on that night, it was dark. And so he accidentally struck Crystal with his car. She smashed into the windshield, which is why it was damaged. He alleges that he then put her body in his vehicle and then just hid her body somewhere. He told police, I'm not gonna tell you where she is, okay? And then eventually he changed his mind and said, okay, this is the area where her body uh, is. They searched that entire area a lot, uh, very extensively. Not a single trace of her remains were found in that area where he said he put her. Police weren't be believing the story about him, him hitting Crystal accidentally. They look at what the truck driver said, that a car had backed towards Crystal's vehicle around 2.34 a.m., I don't know if the truck driver ever confirmed the vehicle. I don't know if he ever saw like pictures of like John's car and like compared and said, yeah, that's the car I saw. I don't know. I I'm guessing not. But it's believed that John Williams, uh, who had a history, again, of abduction and sexual assault, that he saw this young girl uh, in distress and took advantage of the situation. He likely kidnapped her from that spot and then she likely fought like hell and kicked the windshield, causing the damage that was eventually there. But he denied that. He said, nope, that's not what happened. It, it was an accident. Okay, so then why aren't you telling us where her body is then, right? Why aren't you telling police where she is? If it was all an accident, they can prove it. Just, just show us where she is. Give her family that peace, that closure. But he never did. Nope. 
police got other tips from other people, I guess, connected to John saying, hey, maybe you should search this particular area, this particular area. They searched all of those areas, still have never found her. To this very day, Crystal Kipper has never been located. Well, then they linked John Williams to another um, situation where he had raped and abducted another young woman again um she did not she wasn't murdered and so he was charged with that particular crime and he was supposed to go on trial sometime in 1999 for this but he never would uh because john williams decided he didn't want to you know, give crystal kippers family any type of closure any type of answers and he strung a rope up in his jail cell and he he ended his own life and when he did that most hopes of finding crystal most hopes of getting justice for what happened to her and to his other victims all of it went out the window they did find out that when he was in prison uh for this new these new charges he had allegedly said to another cellmate yeah, I did. I killed Crystal on purpose and, you know, hit her body, but never said where he, he you know, hit her, even to the, the inmate. Why do they always talk? It's just, like, just, like, I'm glad you do. I'm glad they talk, but, like, are you, shut up. Like, why do you talk so much? Why do killers always talk so much? It's like bragging. They have to, like, it's like a weird, like, ugh, like, look at me. I'm a big, tough guy. Like, but shut up. Crystal Kipper's case is still technically unsolved. No one was ever formally charged in her abduction, potential murder. Her body, like I said, has never been found. The search still kind of goes on from time to time just to see if there's any hope of finding her remains out there. And I, I sincerely hope that for her family's sake, I really truly hope that they find her remains somehow, some way. Um, there may be people out there who know more about this. Um, you know, John Williams, he's gone now. He's out the picture. You don't have to be afraid of him. So if you have any information about what happened to Crystal that night, if you have any information about where she is, if you can help give this family closure, if you can help give this family the ability to lay their child to rest, please do so. Please contact police. If you have any information about the disappearance and possible murder of Crystal Kipper, you can contact the uh, Platt County, Missouri Sheriff's Office at 816-858-3452. Somewhere, someone out there knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is you. But that is it for this week's case, True Crime, a Rooney Dooney Ding Dongs. If you have tripped, fallen, stumbled your way into this video by accident, well, maybe you should do better, all right? Do better. But hey, you're here, so stick around. Give me a follow here on Facebook. This is a case where the rich and powerful feel that because they are rich and powerful, they could probably get away with murder. Hello, true crimeers of Facebook. This is the case of Emily Puguero. Viewer discretion is advised. Emily Puguero was a 16-year-old girl who was born and raised in Senevi, which is in the Dominican Republic. Emily lived in a family uh, that was considered to be pretty poor. Uh, both of her parents worked the part-time jobs that were paying basically minimum wage at most. She lived a very modest life. For her, it was okay. Uh, she still remained happy and she still loved life. You know, it didn't seem to really bring her down too much. Living across the street from her was the Martinez family, including Marlon Martinez, who was a few years older than her. Uh, they grew up together in the neighborhood, but there was a pretty stark difference between the two. While Emily and her family were poor, um, Marlon and his family were very, very wealthy. They lived in a, a big home with, uh, with security gates around it. The uh, matriarch of the family, Marlene Martinez, 
she I guess was like the former mayor of that town, but she was still involved heavily in politics there. She still held a lot of power. Emily and Marlon would eventually uh, date, um, and this was problematic uh, because there in the Dominican Republic, the age of consent is 18. Um, so at the time that they started dating, Marlon was 18 and Emily was 15. Marlon's mother was like, what are you doing dating a poor girl? Basically, uh, she looked down on uh, Emily and her family, simply because they weren't wealthy, they weren't well-to-do people. The relationship continued. Emily did have reservations about the differences between the families, but she still, you know, continued dating him, and she would eventually get pregnant. In the Dominican Republic, uh, it is illegal across the board to get an abortion. Um, it's also illegal for anyone to assist with an abortion. So if whatever doctor may perform one, they will also face jail time. That being said, Marlon, part of this rich family who has a mother in politics, well, getting a 15-year-old girl pregnant, and that's going to cause a lot of problems. And certainly they can't publicly get an abortion simply because it's against the law. On the morning of August 23rd, 2017, Emily went missing. Emily's parents became concerned halfway through the day. Her friends and other family members also became concerned. They went to their social media apps. Emily hadn't posted anything. They're posting like, hey, has anyone seen Emily? No one has seen her. 24 hours or so after Emily seemed to vanish, her boyfriend, Marlon, and his mother, Marlene, they hold a press conference on the news. They invited the media to their home, into their living room, where Marlon and Marlene would sit in front of the cameras, basically put out a plea for anyone to help find Emily. Marlon, you know, he looked at the camera and said, listen, you know, her and I, we've had problems, but problems are common in every couple. And he said, Emily, no matter where you are, please just come home and we'll be, we'll be here waiting with open arms. And then for pretty much the rest of the interview, he just put his head down and just looked at the floor. Um, and then his mother started talking. She said, quote, this is the quote, she was already a part of us. She was my son's girlfriend, is my son's girlfriend. She was five months pregnant, and when we found out, we gave her our support. This interview immediately took uh, social media by storm there in Dominican Republic because Marlene had used the word was several times and at one point corrected herself by using the current tense is. This is a very uh, common slip up with possible murderers, criminals, um, when, when someone goes missing, especially uh, when you hear them say the word was, when they talk about the potential victim in the past tense. It's something that there, our brains just sort of naturally do when we know where that person probably is. But then Marlene began to cry on camera and say, we feel for her family, we support her family. Even though she had already made her opinions known that this was a poor family and you can't date a girl in a poor family. So suspicion fell on the mother and son very quickly. It is highly unusual that the boyfriend and his mother would throw a press conference within 24 hours of this person going missing. They should have just gone to police, but they didn't. And then... Marlon, uh, within a couple of days, went to the Puguero home and decided to tell them that he's turning himself in. And he, they contact police and he basically surrenders to them. This is coinciding, by the way, with part of the investigation also going on where the, the authorities there had traced Emily's cell phone and they traced her last known ping and it happened to come from the apartment 
that was owned by Marlene Martinez. Uh, she owned an apartment um, for basically when she was traveling. It was a little bit out of town um, and that's where the cell phone was. And then witnesses had claimed that they saw Marlene Martinez coming out of that apartment pretty much the day or the next day after Emily went missing and he was carrying a very large like white bag. And then on August 30th, Marlene turned herself into authorities. She said she only did that because to cooperate with them, but she didn't have anything to do with it, is what she said. That same day though, Marlon confessed. Basically, his mother was angry that he got this 15 year old girl from a poor family pregnant. This is gonna cause her all sorts of problems, um, you know, with her career and in, in the media and all that. Uh, so basically, she told him to somehow find a way to get her an abortion. She didn't care how he did it. So he allegedly drives Emily to his mother's other apartment where he tries to force some kind of abortion to happen, but it fails, it doesn't work. So then he just takes a blunt force instrument and he bashes Emily over the head and he kills her. He then tells police where her body is. They go there, there's no body there. They look for hours and hours and hours. They dig, they look everywhere in the entire surrounding area. There's no body there. But then about a couple of days later, some people stumble across a suitcase in this sort of desolate off the road area. And in the suitcase was a body. It was confirmed to be the decomposing body of Emily Paguero and her fetus. He told police that he called his mother shortly after he killed her. She basically told him, you need to hide the body. You need to put it somewhere. And then when he does it originally, um, in the location where he told police the body would be, where she wasn't, she tells him angrily, like, you hit her there? People are going to find her there. So they go together, they get her body, they put it in the trunk of her car, and then they decide and discuss where we're gonna hide her body now. Um, and so the mother and son basically find a different location where they dispose of her body in the suitcase where it was eventually found. And then from there, basically Marlene said, you know, I'll, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure this doesn't get out. Uh, she knew that her son killed her. She helped him hide the body, and then she tried to help cover the whole thing up. So both people, uh, mother and son, were both arrested and they were charged with ver their various crimes. Marlene would end up basically only being sentenced originally to five years in prison because she did not take any part in the physical murder, but she did help hide the body um, and cover it up. So after her five year sentence, she appealed it about halfway through or so, and she won her appeal, and the sentence was uh, lessened to two years, which she had already served, and then she was released, and she has been free ever since. It's kind of interesting though, that during um, her original trial, um, she was put in a bulletproof vest, um, and at times she was also uh, wearing a helmet uh, for protection, but then her son, got no protection whatsoever. This but this whole thing caused a massive uproar in the Dominican Republic. I mean, there were protests. Um, this was basically, you know, a kind of rich against poor type of battle. Um, and it, it caused a lot of civil unrest in the area. Um, it was a huge story there. And I think a lot of people were pissed that basically, and understandably, that Marlene basically got a slap on the wrist because it almost sounds like she had pushed her son into killing Emily without maybe directly saying the words. And it's actually not known. She may have told him to kill her, but that's never been proven or, or come out. But it sounds like she's more than capable of instructing that kind of thing. Uh, Marlene, her son, was not so lucky, who got no special treatment in court, no protection. Uh, he was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to 30 years where he is still serving his sentence. In the end, the rich and powerful didn't really win per se because this whole thing was uncovered and found out. And uh, the, you know, she is now, the mother is now forever demonized in the community. She's hated. Her life is ruined, at least. 
But yeah, a poor 16 year old girl had to get murdered. And it was simply because she was poor, really. If you, th if you really think about it, it's because she was poor. And the rich mom didn't like that, didn't like her. Oh, she got pregnant? Well, gotta get rid of her. It's just so sad. But that is the end of this case. At about this time, a guy come running out of the trees on the left-hand side. He ran down and grabbed her by the back of the head of the hair and jerked her up. And she grabbed the towel and he, 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 he walked her up into the trees. Hello, true face crimeers. This is the case of Heather Teague. Viewer discretion is advised. Heather Danielle Teague was born on April 25th, 1972, and she lived in Spotsville, Kentucky. I can't really seem to find much background information on Heather, though, so I apologize for that. But on August 26th, 1995, Heather was out at Newburgh Beach there in Kentucky, and she was just sunbathing, something she did all the time. Now, I'm assuming there really wasn't many other people on the beach, if anyone at all, because given what happens next, you think someone would have seen something more close up. But at approximately 12.45 p.m. on August 26, 1995, as Heather was sunbathing, a man would call the police. State police, dispatcher Davis. Uh, yes, sir. I just called the Indiana State Police. I live in Newburgh, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, I was sitting at the dinner table, we got through eating dinner, and I got a telescope. I live right on the river, mm -hmm. and I scanned the beach or straight across from the beach from the Lock and Dam. Mm -hmm. And there was a girl on the left-hand side of the trees down here, and she was sunbathing, and she was laying face down, and she had her top undone, and she was just bathing. And uh, I was looking back and forth across the beach, and I told Karen, I, and I said, you know, I just listened to her. I said, I was, I, you know, I just looked at the beach. And about this time, a guy come running out of the trees on the left-hand side. And he ran down and grabbed her by the back of the head of the hair and jerked her up. And she grabbed the towel and he, he, he walked her up in the trees up on, in the riverbank over here. Mm. And I've been watching now for 25 minutes, and I ain't seen her come back. And all of her stuff still sitting down there on the beach. Where's she at on the beach, sir? She was, you know where the new lock dam is? The new bird lock and dam? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, so basically, what the man would tell police in like a seven or eight minute phone call is that he was across, I guess, the beach or across the river at his home with a telescope and he was just looking over the beach. He said he saw, who would eventually later be identified as Heather Teague, she was lying on her stomach and through his telescope, he noticed that her uh, bra was undone. And all of a sudden, a man walks up behind her, unsuspecting to her, and he grabs her by the hair, and then he begins to pull her into the nearby uh, wooded area. And he also had a gun to her head. Now, this is why I'm thinking that there could not have really been anyone else on the beach at the time, because you figure someone would have seen this and stopped it, I would hope. The man who observed this described this person as a white male, approximately six foot tall. He probably weighed between 210 to 230 pounds or so, so he was a bigger guy. And most importantly, he described this person as having kind of long, unkempt brown hair and a bushy beard. So when police arrived to the beach, they saw where Heather had been laying. They found her belongings, including her bra. They then go into the wooded area where the gentleman said that this that she was dragged into and they don't find her, they don't find any clothing items, they don't find anything. They don't find like shoe impressions, they don't find any signs that anything or anyone had been in that area recently. And apparently another witness I guess would say later that they saw Heather's vehicle parked there um, in the parking lot right by the beach and there was another car parked right next to hers when there were plenty of other parking spots available. And that car was a red and white Ford Bronco. And by the way, it was the items at the beach, I guess her identification or something was there where police knew that it was Heather Teague who was taken. And so they alerted her family and then her family obviously became extremely concerned immediately 
and they didn't know anyone necessarily who matched the description of who the man said took her. Police searched and searched and searched, and they got volunteers to help, not just that particular area, but they searched across the beach. They searched everywhere. And to this very day, Heather Teague has never been found. You know, in the years since, they have found human remains uh, just, you know, over the course of time. This is, you know, a few decades ago now. And none of those human remains were ever identified as being Heather's. So she has just vanished. Sometime soon, very soon after Heather was what they think was kidnapped off the beach, uh, a man was pulled over who was driving a Ford Bronco that matched the description of the one that was seen parked next to Heather's car at the beach. The driver of that vehicle was Marvin Ray Dill, and he would go by Marty. Because his car matched the description of one that was seen at the crime scene, uh, they were able to get a warrant to search his vehicle. In his vehicle, they find essentially what can be perceived as a kidnapping kit. They find guns, they find knives, they find duct tape, rubber gloves, and rope. They also find uh, a few strands of hair. Hair that would later be identified as something that would match Heather's style of hair. But they could not, you know, back then they couldn't say DNA-wise if that was her hair or not. And I think to this day, I don't think there was enough uh, DNA evidence in those hair samples to even show who they ever belonged to, unfortunately. But they were consistent with Heather's hair. So here's why it's kind of important to remember that the man was described as having a lot of hair and a bushy beard. A composite drawing was made of the perpetrator that the guy of the telescope claimed he saw. The composite drawing was nearly identical to a mugshot of Marty Dill. It reminds me a lot of the Stephen Avery case, his 1985 sexual assault trial, where the composite drawing of him was literally a copy of his uh, mugshot. Uh, and that's it's very similar to this. And what's, why it's interesting is that Marty Dill had recently served time in jail. And when he was in jail, and this was just before the kidnapping, there was a lice outbreak at the jail. So everyone there had their heads shaved and their beards shaved. So they were all clean shaven because of this. Marty Hill, when he was pulled over, didn't have any hair or a beard. So technically, he did not match the description of the man that took her from the beach that day. Now, after the traffic stop and they pulled evidence from his truck, they they let him go. I mean, he didn't they didn't have any evidence to actually charge him with anything at that time. Later on in 1995, they would go to his house because they were getting more and more tips that he was involved in Heather's kidnapping. When police arrived at the scene, Marty Dill put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger, and he ended his life. Marty had a wife then, and police were still convinced that Marty was the guy. He was the person who did this. So they tried to basically still indict him, and they wanted to have his wife come in and testify to the grand jury, but she pled the fifth on every question, and she wouldn't answer anything. That's when another man came into question. His name was Christopher J. Below. He was from that area in Kentucky. He was also acquaintances with Marty Dill. He, at the time, had a lot of, you know, scraggly long hair, and he did have a beard, but it wasn't like a big bushy beard like was described. Now, later on, and this is after Heather's disappearance, Christopher J. Below was convicted of the kidnapping of another woman. Her name, I guess, was Catherine Fetzer. Even though she was never found, uh, they basically ruled her disappearance a homicide. And so would be convicted of her manslaughter, and he was then sentenced to 11 to 18 years in prison. But he was out and about in 1995 uh, when Heather disappeared. 
He hadn't been even arrested for the other case until later on. He's also suspected of being involved in the kidnappings or disappearances, at least, of a few other women in that area. And like these other women bear a kind of a striking resemblance to Heather. He seemed to have like a type. The thing is, is basically anyone who witnessed anything to do with Heather Teague's disappearance essentially all pointed to Marty Dill and not Christopher Below. Christopher Below was just more of someone that came onto police's radar through circumstance, but not through witness statements. Heather Teague's mother um, would later go on to file like lawsuits against the local police because she believes that they pursued the wrong person and that ended in that person's death, you know, Marty Dill. She is, she's not saying that he wasn't involved, but because, you know, there is a possibility that Marty Dill and Christopher Below worked together on this because they did know of each other. They knew each other a little bit and it's very possible they could have done this together because if you're going off of what each man looked like at that time, Christopher Below was more similar in appearance to who kidnapped Heather than Marty Dill had looked at the time. There are rumors that whoever kidnapped her could have been wearing a wig in disguise. That is possible. Considering there was no up-close witnesses, only a man through a telescope from afar, they really couldn't say whether or not the man was wearing a wig or not. But the fact of the matter remains is that Christopher Below has never been charged with any connection to do with Heather Teague's disappearance. The other suspect, Marty Dill, is dead. There is no physical evidence that has ever come back to point to either man's guilt. It could be very possible that neither man had anything to do with this. It could be very possible that one or the other did it, or they could have been working together. Christopher Below has not said a word about it, and it doesn't sound like he ever will say a word about it. And now, obviously you can't question Marty Dill anymore. And then when it comes down to it even more, Heather Teague is still missing. She has never been recovered. They do believe that she is deceased. She was declared legally dead uh, years ago. Her mother still holds out hope that maybe, just maybe, she is out there somewhere. But the grim reality is that more than likely Heather Teague was killed the day she was taken. And now it's just a matter of knowing where she is so that her family could lay her to rest properly. And then once she's found, hopefully, Heather and her family could get the justice she deserves. If you have any information about the disappearance of Heather Teague, you can contact the authorities in Henderson County, Kentucky, and you can report any information you have anonymously and you can help get this family the closure they deserve. But that is it for this case, True Crime Maroonies. I hope you found it interesting. Hello, True Face Crimers. This is the case of Jackie Johns. Viewer discretion is advised. Jacqueline Sue Johns, who would go by Jackie to everyone in her life. She was born on June 7th, 1965 in Springfield, Missouri. And she was the baby of four total children who were all girls. By the time this story takes place, Jackie and her family, they live in Nixa, Missouri. And in that area, Jackie was very popular. She was well known. Everyone loved her. She was someone that could always make someone smile whenever, you know, they were in a, in a, in a dark place. She had a ton of charm and she was just a very uplifting individual. She was also quite stunning. She was a very beautiful woman. And the, I guess there was a, an annual festival they have there, I guess called the Sucker Day Festival. And along with that were like, a, was like pageants. And so Jackie was a former pageant winner at this festival. Jackie worked at a local diner and as a waitress, and she, you know, was always like the most pleasant waitress you can possibly have. Sometimes people would just go there just to see her, just to be, you know, be to be waited on by her. And that's just sort of the person she was. It was June 17th, 1985. Jackie was working a shift at the diner and she got off 
sometime in the evening. It was a really, I guess the fog was super dense that night. And so driving in the fog was something that could be kind of treacherous. She drove a, uh, a Chevy Camaro and she had her own like personal license plate, which was Jackie one. After she left her shift at work, uh, she was expected home, you know, not too soon after that, but she never got home, which wasn't completely unusual. I mean, she was 20 years old at the time of this story. So, you know, she could have just gone to a friend's house or something like that. This was obviously before cell phones and all that. But the following morning on US Highway 160, a little south of Springfield, a, a local man noticed Jackie's car pulled off to the side of the road. He knew Jackie because, you know, Jackie was known by a lot of people. And the man went to the diner where she worked at and told, you know, her boss, hey, I saw Jackie's car on the side of the road. Is that kind of strange? So Jackie's boss would call her family and their family's like, "Ugh, you know, Jackie, she sometimes does that. Maybe she ran out of gas and then just hoofed it to a friend's house, you know. But police would still go to investigate the car. And when they got there, the door was still partially open. The keys were in the car. Her purse was in the car. But Jackie was nowhere to be found. More concerning is there was blood in the car and not just a little bit. There was there was quite a bit. They search the area. They look all over. They can't find her. So they officially put this out as a missing persons report. And the community is now actively trying to find her. The search for Jackie Johns would not last very long. It would be about four days later when there were fishermen who were fishing at a lake there uh, near in Springfield, when all of a sudden a body floated to the surface. It was a woman's body. So they rushed to inform police. Police arrive and they pull the body from the lake. And the body hadn't really been all that decomposed. And they were able to decipher who this person was. It was the body of 20-year-old Jackie Johns. Jackie was nude. She was covered in bruises. She had a significant amount of trauma to her head. They determined that she was likely killed by blunt force trauma with probably a, a tire jack. They were able to definitively determine that she was sexually assaulted. And even after being in the water, they found male bodily fluid inside of her and they were able to collect it. Back in 1985 though, they really couldn't do um, do much with that, but thankfully they collected it. Back in Jackie's car, they did find a receipt to a 7-Eleven and it was close to the diner where she worked. There was a timestamp on that receipt. The timestamp put her at that 7-Eleven sometime around 11 p.m. that evening. So they know that she was alive at 11 because they went to the 7-Eleven and confirmed that they did see her there, that it was her who made that purchase. And then judging by the autopsy, they were able to determine that she was killed definitely that night, the night she went missing. And so now they have a very small window of time of when she was killed sometime after 11 p.m., probably around 1 to 2 in the morning-ish. Jackie did have a boyfriend at the time. They were a happy couple. They never had any fights or arguments like that. Everything was going good for them. And they were able to very quickly rule him out that he was that he was not anywhere near where she would have been taken uh, during that time. They also went to the diner. They wanted to interview people, you know, who worked with her. And maybe someone had this crazy obsession with her. It's, you know, she is a beautiful young waitress you know, there is that possibility. And there were people who said that there was a guy that always kind of came off creepy, uh, was always a little tor too weird towards her. So they wanted to find out where he was. And he was quickly ruled out because he was in jail. Jackie's friends would uh, tell police that Jackie told them that she was apparently feeling nervous for some reason in the days leading up to her murder. She said she felt like she was being watched, but she never really could pinpoint who or why, she just felt very uneasy. Then police got a humongous tip. They were told that on the night that Jackie was taken, near that same 7-Eleven, there was a very distinctive vehicle seen there of a car that everyone in town knew. 
It was a blue and white. Uh, it was an old Chevrolet truck. It was like a 60s style truck. Once that witness came forward to say they saw them at near the 7-Eleven, other, two other witnesses came forward to say they also saw that exact same truck in the area during the time Jackie would have gone missing after 11 p.m. Everyone in town knew this truck. Everyone in town knew its owner. It was a 28-year-old man named Gerald Carnahan. He was the son of an extremely wealthy businessman in that area. His father owned several businesses. Everyone knew the Carnahans. They were not strangers to anyone in that entire area. He also went to the diner that Jackie worked at all the time. And the two of them did know each other because Jackie used to work at a, one of the companies that uh, his dad owned. She worked there for a brief time and he also worked there. And apparently when they worked together, she always felt very uneasy about this man. He would always harass her. Uh, he would always be very creepy towards her. And so eventually she left, but then there wasn't any more issues between the two of them, it appeared. But no one really had a good word to say about this man. He was not well liked. But police brought him in anyway because his truck was seen in the area. And so when he was brought in for questioning, he said, well, I was home. I got home that night at 1045 p.m. I was with my stepdaughter. The stepdaughter allegedly confirmed that he was there sometime around 1045 with her because they were together. The issue, though, is the police know that Jackie was killed probably well after 11 p.m. When Gerald and his stepdaughter got home that night at 10.45 p.m., they, they split and they went their separate ways in the house. She said she didn't hear him leave at 11 p.m. or any time around then. And she says she thinks she would have heard him leave if he did. She also couldn't say for absolute certainty. When they were questioning Gerald, he had bruises on his body something like he had been in a recent fight with someone. Gerald's brother would then call police and say, I also saw my brother's car in that area that night after 11 p.m., his own brother. But they had no physical evidence. They had absolutely no proof that he had anything to do with this murder. All they know is he was probably lying about being out of the house that night after 11 o'clock, but that doesn't make him a killer. He also was not forthcoming with police about his prior relationship with Jackie. He never, it wasn't him who ever stated that, you know, they had that tumultuous relationship that where he would always flirt with her at work and he tried to ask her out. He omitted all of that information and basically said he barely knew her, just that he had worked with her, but he didn't really know her that well. So that technically counted as obstruction of justice. So they actually put out a warrant for him to arrest him for obstruction of justice or as basically tampering with evidence, so to speak. And when they went to arrest him, they found out he had just left to go to the airport. He was on his way to fly to, to uh, Los Angeles in California. And then from there, the plan was for him to go to Thailand. So he was fleeing at this point. But luckily, police arrived in time to arrest him at the airport. They charged him with tampering with evidence, but that did not last long, unfortunately, because the, the tampering with evidence was such a weak kind of case. It was really just a more of a, we need to get something on them, that they didn't really even have solid evidence to say he intended to tamper with evidence. So unfortunately, he was let go and the charges were dropped. And then the case just went cold. Um, they got no more leads, no more tips. They had no more evidence. And then 1993 came along. In 1993, in Springfield, Missouri, Gerald Carnahan, along with a friend, decided to attempt to kidnap an 18-year-old girl. They did not do this in any sneaky way. They tried to kidnap her on a very busy part of town during a time when people were out and about. And they did so knowing that everyone knew Gerald Carnahan and what he looked like, and people saw him. The kidnapping failed, um, and so police, though, were able to arrest him for attempting to kidnap this girl, as well as his friend. And he actually went to, to trial, and he was convicted of attempted kidnapping. But he was only sentenced to two years in prison. After he was released, um, he pretty much laid low, and the case laid low. 
They, again, even with all of that, they still had no proof. They had no physical evidence. They had nothing to connect him physically to the murder of Jackie Johns. Their break would not come until 2006. In 2006, a cold case team decided to reopen the Jackie Johns murder case. And they realized, or remembered, I guess, hey, we've got this semen sample that we had collected back then that we couldn't do anything with back then. They couldn't do anything with it even throughout the 90s. Like There wasn't much they could do with it. But finally, in 2006, they had enough technology to extract the DNA from the semen, and they were able to develop a pretty strong profile. Because he was considered a suspect back in the uh, 1985 original investigation, because of all of the circumstantial evidence they had, they were able to successfully obtain a warrant to collect his DNA. So they got Gerald Carnahan's DNA, and then they ran it against the semen sample, and what do you know? It was a match, 100% match. It was one of those, like, one in blah, 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 trillion, you know, uh, match things that it could only ever have possibly been him and him alone. So he was arrested and charged with the sexual assault and the murder of Jackie Johns. In 2010, he finally went on trial. The witnesses who had all seen the truck back in 1985, all of them were still alive and they all testified against him. His own brother testified against him about seeing his vehicle. They also uh, brought the stepdaughter in for uh, her, a testimony, and she admitted that she was probably wrong about thinking that he couldn't have left the house that night, that she literally didn't see him. And, you know, after they got home at 1045 p.m., she didn't see him and she didn't hear him leave. But she also says that doesn't mean he didn't leave the house. I just didn't hear it. So his alibi of being home was now gone. And then a jury of his peers found him guilty and convicted him of the murder of Jackie Johns. Gerald Carnahan was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, so he will never see the light of day again. It may have taken a few decades, but Jackie Johns, this beautiful, intelligent, funny, vibrant young woman who had her entire life ahead of her, whose life was stolen by some creep who just couldn't take no for an answer, she finally got her justice. And that is it for this case, True Crime Aronies. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as usual, if you have seen me for the very first time today, if you've tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories. I tell four a week over on YouTube, one here on Facebook every Friday, also one every Thursday on Instagram, and then a few throughout the week uh, on TikTok. So please follow me here. And I have a link tree in my Facebook uh, bio here. If you click on that link tree, you can see all my other socials as well, and you can follow me other places if you so choose. But that is it for this video. So we will see you next Friday here on Facebook for the next case. And until then, ta-ta for now. True crime a rooney, doony ding dongs. All right. Yeah.